ready for takeoff. Hi Rubikov, last stretch before lunch. Are you as exci excited as I am? Ooh. Okay, hi everybody, and welcome to Staff Engineer, Here Be Dragons. My name is Alexandre Terraza. Uh, I'm a staff engineer at Shopify. You can reach me by email because I'm an old person apparently. Um, and we're hiring, so if you're interested in what we're doing and want to have a chat with us, please come join us at the booth after, uh, after this talk. I'm a member of the Ruby and Rails infrastructure team. Uh, I work with those amazing people and much more that are not in the picture. We're working on things such as the Ruby language, the Rails framework, um, some projects like YJIT, Truffle Ruby, Syntax Tree, or the Ruby LSP. And so this talk is about dragons. So what about Here Be Dragons? Here Be Dragons is or uncharted areas of the maps uh, were marked in medieval time, where people never went before, and where we didn't know what was there. It was used to mark the potential danger, the unknown. It's actually not completely true. The real, ex uh, the real um, uh, expression wa uh, was here are lions, but unless you're Lannister, it doesn't have the, has the same ring to it. But what is the relationship with this talk? As I started my career, before, being like a junior engineer, an engineer, senior engineer, all these paths seem very well defined, rather non-territory. But being a staff engineer and higher, for me, this is where the lions were. Where like, it was not completely clear what was expected of me and why, what I was to be expecting about this position. So I wanted to give this talk so together we can learn a bit more about this position and demystify what it means to, to be leading uh, beyond the management track. As a disclaimer, I do not pretend to be a reference in the matter. Uh, I do not even pretend to be a good staff engineer. And there are a few people from my team here, so I don't want to be lying. And so at the, as the methodology for this talk, I didn't want it to, do, to do this by myself. Uh, I wanted to have the advices of like more senior people uh, other staff engineers and senior staff engineers from uh, my team. So I really want to thank all the people here that helped me uh, understand better what is their experience uh, as a staff engineer, what is their take on this uh, position, and to answer all the awkward questions I've been asking them over the last few weeks. I also want to point you to two amazing resources, those books. Uh, the first one is uh, Staff Engineer by Will Larson. The second one is Staff Engineer's Path by Tanya Rayleigh. I really encourage them to read them if you are like, curious about what it is to be a staff engineer, if you want to become one, or even if you uh, are one already. And to better understand what are staff engineers, let's go back a bit uh, in our journey from junior to senior engineer. So we started here as a junior engineer, maybe out of like university or I don't know. And our goal at this level is to level up our craft. Uh, we work as part of a team, we start contributing to projects, but we ship code with a, lot of, uh, with a lot of oversight. We take direction from more senior people on how to build things. We use their guidance to understand what is the impact we can do. And this impact at this level is mostly individual. We grow ourselves, we grow our own skills. Then as we progress, we reach the level of engineer. We continue level, uh, leveling up our craft, uh, growing our skills, but we start collaborating more and more with other members of our team. We apply the best practices we learned before from our more senior colleagues, and we start to ship code more independently. We provide feedback to colleagues, but the impact we still have at this level is mostly individual. And then, finally, we reach senior engineer. We are now a trusted expert of the code base we work on. We require less much, um, much less oversight on the code we ship. We understand better what is the long-term impact of the technical decision we take. This is going to help us to contribute to new technical patterns, to all the peers accountable on, for example, reviews, to follow those technical patterns, and we start leading the, uh, leading the technical direction of the projects we work on. The impact level we have at this, uh, this, this level, sorry, the impact we have at this level is much more about our peers. We start impacting more people than just ourselves. And so what now? In most companies, 
the, the title of senior engineer is what they call the career level. Uh, it is intended to be the, the highest level that most of us are going to achieve. And while you may get into trouble, if you do not move from junior to senior fast enough, there are actually no expectations for you to go higher than senior engineer. But what if, what if you want to go further? You have two paths in front of you. The first one is the management track, the engineering management, some, some people call this the people track, uh, where you're going to find the levels as uh, you know, engineering manager, senior manager, director, or VP. This is the track where you're most concerned about things like performance reviews, career progression. And if you're not at ease with the people track, you have an, another opportunity, the technical track. What is the technical leadership? This is where you're going to find the levels such as staff engineers, uh, sometimes we call this tech lead or architect, depending on the companies, then senior engineer, principal, distinguished engineer. And this is the track we're going to focus on today, and most, like, uh, most precisely on the level of staff engineer. So let's talk about this. Where for me the dragons were, and it seemed less, less defined for me because first, this level is not available in all companies, depends on the maturity of the company. And also statistically, there are less of them than senior engineers, so you get more, less like blog articles and like uh, explanations about what is this role. If we go back a bit in history, the title staff engineer most likely comes from the British Navy. With the advent of the steam engine in 1835, the British Navy created the naval engineers, the Royal Naval Engineers, sorry, uh, a branch that was composed of naval engineers that were here to um, manage and upkeep all the, the machinery on top of, uh, on, on board of the boats, like for example, the steam frigates and everything. And in 1885, it was proposed that the more senior of the chief engineers should receive the commission as staff with the relative, the relative rank of staff lieutenant in other branches. This rank was thus accorded to engineers having between eight and 15 years of seniority. As for the prefix staff itself, it actually derives from the German word Stab, which at the time was used to designate a group of military officers that were here to assist a commander in, uh, in his uh, decisions. The staff rank is actually still be used in the army. It is just above um, sergeant and just below first, sergeant first class. Staff sergeants are generally placed in charge of a squad, which is around 10 soldiers, but also can act as platoon leaders, which is two to five squads. And this ties up to what staff engineers are today. They assume the leadership of a team, which could be a squad, or a cluster of teams, like a plateau. And what they do is first identify technical problems and create solutions impacting their wall area. They lead and align the technical direction of ambiguous projects for a team. They evolve the team processes, the tools, and the code bases to deliver higher throughput and quality of engineering. They are here to grow their team by identifying the development needs and addressing them through education and mentorship. They are here to empower others to make decisions. And here we can see that the scale of impact is no more us, no more our peers, but the whole team and sometimes teams around us. But I really enjoyed this uh, shorter definition from uh, Rose Wigley, who is a senior staff engineer at Shopify. She actually uh, used this quote during a closing keynote for the RubyConf Mini uh, a few weeks ago. A senior engineer is a problem solver. A staff engineer is a problem finder. A problem finder. Indeed, as a staff engineer, your role is to find the next challenges of strategical value for your company, the priorities that will become critical in the future. You are here to think, uh, to think, to think ahead to see the bigger picture and try to anticipate the problems that may come. But all of this is still, was still a bit not as, as uh, much concrete as I wanted when I started. And something that helps me see like, okay, what are you actually going to do week by week, day by day? So I wanted to give you a more concrete view of what is, what is going to be your future if you reach this position. And to do so, let's materialize this as a weekly schedule. This is a classic nine to five template. We have, some, we have some family obligation before and after, so no much time for uh, overtime. And let's set, a time, uh, set, uh, set apart some time for lunch because I really like to have lunch. First, as a staff engineer, you are still part of a team. You still answer to an engineering manager. You still take part in the team rituals. And you are not exempted magically from all your obligations as a team, mem as a team member. 
So you will participate in maybe uh, the morning, Monday morning sprint planning. You will have a one-on-one -on -one with your engineering manager. You take part in some stand-ups and some team rituals, maybe, for example, team social at the end of the week. Very important if you're working remotely like me. And this is already taking some, some place in your schedule. As we saw, you're also here to set the technical direction for your team. How does that like work in your schedule? If we go back to our schedule here, first, we're going to allocate some time to do code reviews. Code reviews are a very important tool to ensure that the team builds the right thing in the right code base at the right level of the stack. It's very useful to maintain the level of engineering quality we're expecting and we thrive for. And it keeps us aware of what is happening around us, what the team is doing, what other teams around us are, are working on. As a trusted area uh, expert in your area, you're going to be uh, we're going to be pulled in a few meetings. For example, um, a strategy meeting where we, as we are aware of the next problems and challenges the, com the company is going to face, we'll be here to help selecting uh, what are the next projects we should be working on and keeps us aligned with like authority and higher management. We also may be pulled in an alignment meeting with other teams uh, to decide what is the next technical direction we're going to take uh, over the broad area we are like an expert of and to bring our engineering perspective to build, uh, to build cross-team cross relationships with others so we can have a line of communication. Or maybe we can be pulled in a tech review meeting so we can bring our domain expertise and help solve problems. So a few more hours in our planning. Now, for all the staff engineers I interviewed or read about or heard in podcasts, mentoring and sponsorship is one of the most important activity, if not the most important they were talking about. And they all dedicate a couple of hours each week to grow their team and the people around them. Remember that the scale of impact here is the team scale, the people around you and maybe the people in the teams around you. And you're here to foster growth, to up-level the team, up-level the people in your team and empower them to make decisions. You basically try to clone yourself, but clone them even better than yourself so you can delegate decisions and rely on them when you need. So if we go back to a weekly planning, First, we're going to schedule a few one-on-ones with the people in our team. Uh, maybe as mentor, we're going to help them grow their inner role and navigate their career. Uh, we're going to use this time to gather feedback uh, about our processes. Uh, maybe we can discuss the current problems the team have, um, the, the solution we're trying to implement. It's a very important part of the communication. And again, if you work remotely, you're not going to meet these people at the coffee maker. So that may be a very good, uh, a very good time to talk with them. Then we're going to schedule a few pairing sessions. If you were in this room just for the previous talk, pairing is a very effective tool to both learn and teach. And we want to do this with different people at different seniority levels. Um, I find that more than an hour is hard for me to focus. And generally I try to do it just with one person, maximum two persons at the same time. Growing the team, that also means bringing new people in the team. So we're going to allocate a few, a few slots uh, in the week uh, ideally at different hours to accommodate, to accommodate candidates from different time zones so we can interview them. And if this process of hiring is successful, we get a new person in the team. That means more one-on-one, -on -one, more pairing, more onboarding to do. Being a staff engineer also makes sure that the team is going to succeed and is going to thrive. Tanya Reilly defines this as being glue. This is all the non-glamorous, almost invisible, yet very essential work for a team or an organization to thrive. If we go back to a weekly planning here, we're going to maybe take notes. We took notes during the meetings we've been, uh, we've been invited at, and we're going to tidy up those notes, share them with the rest of the organization. We're going to set about some time to talk with one member that has a problem right now, or like discuss a, solu a solution that someone is going to try to implement. And we, hired, we just hired someone, so we're going to dedicate a few hours to onboard this person and make them effective, make them productive faster. And as we were doing this onboarding, we realized that maybe something about the processes can be ex explained better in the team playbook, so we're going to take apart an hour to like enhance this, or maybe add some documentation time so we can explain better an obscure, uh, an obscure area of the code base we're working on, and we want this onboarded person to, uh, to master uh, faster. So, Let's address the elephant in the room and the question I get asked like often, do you still code? Well, you still have some time. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you can be coding a bit. In practice, 
And for all the people I interview, the general answer is yes, but less than before. You have less time available for it. And this time may be eaten up by other responsibilities, maybe some more technical direction work, maybe some more mentoring, may maybe some more glue work. The time you have to allocate to this becomes scarcer at times goes. Coding needs to be more specialized, more focused. But I still think it's a very important part of our day to day. It's something that is very important to keep doing. It keeps you grounded in reality. And I find that refactoring is actually a very good exercise to keep touch with the code base and the problem space. How much time you're actually going to allocate to each task depends a lot and may evolve over time. It depends on the engineering strength of your company. Maybe you are in a startup and what you're going to do in your day to day is more like solve the next problem that is coming for this next killer feature you want to implement. Maybe you work for a more mature company and now like handling technical depth is more important. It also depends on the needs of your team. Maybe you're onboarding a lot of new people now and you need to spend more time onboarding them. Um, maybe you are in between projects and what you want to, know, to do now is work on your team processes so the next project is more successful, more likely to be successful. Oh, it also depends on your own affinities to some task, and everybody I interviewed is a bit different and handle their role successfully, but differently in each case. So are you more of a mentor? Are you more of a technical expert about something? Or are you more someone that is here to build strong connections with other people in other teams? It all depends. I find that for me, the role of a staff engineer is a lot like the cartographer, someone that is at the intersection of the adventurer, the explorator, and the map maker. Someone that, when maps still had dragons on them, has to go there, see what is there, and then come back and realize it to the team so they can go forward. Wikipedia defines the role as a cartographer as follows. A cartographer combines science, aesthetic, technique to model reality, and communicates spatial information effectively. And here, the spatial information is your problem space, which you're like facing every day and what you became the trusted expert here in. And interestingly, cartography and the position of a staff engineer share a lot of interesting similarities. And I built this uh, diagram of the technical direction setting based on what is the cartographic process. And I adapted it a tiny bit to be matching what the staff engineer is doing. We start by observing our environment. We use data collection, for example, benchmarking, profiling, reading tickets and issues, talking with people, and some kind of gut feeling to get a better idea of like, what are the problems in a problem space. Once we figured out those problems, we're going to encode them into what we call the technical direction. This is where we're going to apply some kind of generalization, take some bags of problem and find the common root causes, find who, who are the different person working on similar problems, and we're going to apply generalization and abstraction to remove all the irrelevant details that we, need to do, we do not need to communicate. This technical direction, we're going to feed it to the engineers in your team who are going to decode it based on their own interpretation of what is the environment. And they are going to use this technical direction to implement the solution. It's very important to see the distinction between the staff engineer, the problem finder, and the senior engineer, the problem solver. And they're going to solve this problem, which is going to impact our environment, and we do another loop. We, uh, we again assess the environment, find new problems, set a new technical direction, and we go again. If you look at old maps, for example this one, or even in the background of my, uh, my slides here, you can see a lot of different lines. Those are old maps we call uh, a Windrose network, or Remline network, or sometimes Arbo finding charts. They are forming a grid in a map, and before like people had GPS, they were used by navigators to find using those lines and like visible landmarks around them, where to go, where is the next harbor they should be, they should be going, and which direction they should be following. And for me, as a cartographer, you are here to set those lines, to set those lines. One line is one technical direction, one iteration of the loop, then you're going to do another one, you're going to set another line, and you're going to, co to create an engineering strategy. And the overlap of all those strategies is going to create your engineering vision, and you're going to help senior engineers navigate the problem space and find the next solution for all the problems you found on the, road, on the way. By talking with people, I found a few advices that I found very, very useful for my career, and that was very happy to put in those, uh, in those slides. 
First, be impactful. We saw that you don't have a lot of time to be actually working on problems. You have a lot of glue work to do, a lot of mentoring. The time you have is getting scarcer, and yet, as you climb up the, the hierarchy, you are expected to be more and more impactful. So it's important to work on what really matters. Focus on high impact work. This is generally not the low effort one. This is generally slower. This is on longer time frames. Find what is of strategic value for your company. Work on what you are specifically qualified to work on. Things that your company is doing okay right now, but could be doing great with your help. Keep up on what others are doing. Read the weekly updates, the, status, the project status. Find the common bags of problems that people are having and find duplicated efforts and people that are trying to solve the similar things around you. Don't be a hero. Don't forget that you are here to build a team. You are a team builder. Don't try to do everything by yourself. Be mindful of the common, oh, if I do it, it's going to take me five minutes. But if you do it, a more junior person in your team is not going to learn about it. You are here to build them too. Leave space for others. It's very important. For example, when you're in a meeting, you can let the more junior people talk first, so you're sure to not be squashing opinions. And more importantly, don't be an asshole. Don't go with the, I am a staff engineer, I know what I'm talking about. Most generally, you don't. <laughs> Surround yourself with people you can rely on. Create a network of peers of other staff engineers and staff plus engineers so you can rely on them when you're unsure, when you don't know what is the exact uh, technical direction you should be following. People that can validate your gut feelings, uh, validate your directions, and people you can rely on when you have a problem or you're just like, you know, feeling a bit insecure in your position. Be a partner to your engineering manager. You will note that as you progress in your career, the one-on-ones with your engineering manager are going to be much less about yourself personally, but much more about the team around you, or to get the team to thrive. And you want to be here to help this, this person, your engineer manager, to set the best environment for the team to succeed, to find what are the problems that the team is, like, uh, is having right now, and how we can fix them so we can be more impactful on the next iteration. Make yourself visible. There is a lot of behind the scene work that you're going to do. Find a way to be visible both internally and externally. Maybe talk about what you're doing, do project updates, explain on Slack what is the, the problem you're trying to find out right now. Present your work to executives. Or Julia Evans is a very good uh, example of what you can do, which is a Bragg document, a document where you fill uh, all the nice tiny things you've been doing to make this, the team more successful so you can help your engineering manager and others to understand the impact you have behind the scenes. And don't forget that this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. Don't burn yourself too quickly. You are playing the long game here. You are not going to solve very hard problems in a week. You are going to solve them in years, maybe. Expand slowly and expand deliberately so you don't get burned on the first iteration. But how do you become a staff engineer? First, ask you really this question. Do you really want to become one? You've seen what is the weekly schedule of someone that is in this position. Is this really what you want to do? If you like to spend your weeks coding, maybe it's not the right position for you. Don't get yourself miserable just to access a title. It's not worth it. Define, if you really want to be one, define what kind of staff engineer you want to do. Be really clear about what you want your role to be and what you want to do in your day to day. Talk to other staff engineers in your company. Understand what they do, what makes them successful. Uh, what kind of work energizes you? Find the right problem space for you and what is motivating you week after week. Ask yourself this question, what makes you impactful? Be one before becoming one. No good manager I ever, I ever said like, oh, this person is a very good senior engineer. What? Let's promote them to staff engineer and see what happens. It's not working like this. It's very important to be exhi uh, exhibiting the values even before getting there. Show ownership. Help people in your team. Grow the people around you. Help setting the technical direction for your team. Talk with other staff engineers and see what, where are the problems you could be helping solve. Once you're sure about this and you know where to go and you're already exhibiting those values, find yourself a sponsor. May it be your engineering manager, a mentor, another staffless engineer, Someone with the the, a seat at the table when promotions are given. Someone who can vouch for you when the time comes. And finally, if everything fails, 
Maybe it's time to look for another company. Not all the companies have the staff position you're looking for. Maybe all the, the position in your current company are already like taken. Maybe it's the time to look if someone else needs your help somewhere else. As Bert Fan, who is a principal engineer at Slack, says, reaching staff is a combination of luck, timing, and work. So here, I hope that this short talk helped you understand a bit more what is the reality of being a staff engineer, and that now when you look at this area on the map, you don't see dragons anymore. If you need resources about this subject, uh, the staffeng.com website is amazing. It's a trove of information with a lot of, uh, with a lot of um, um, exam examples and explanation of what you should be doing as a staff engineer or to, get a, uh, or to become a better one. There is also a link to the book of uh, Will Larson and a podcast with interviews of a lot of uh, staff risk engineers in other companies, very useful. Uh, the NoID uh, blog is the, the website of Tanya Rayleigh with a link to her book and the glue work, a talk about the glue work uh, she was talking about before, we were talking about before. And finally, the blog from Julia Evans about uh, how to build a brag, brag document. Thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes if you have questions. If not, you can always find me here or the Shopify booth after the talk if you want to discuss about this. So the question I think is, how do you cope with you not being solving the problem yourself? Uh, I think this is where you realize at some point you grow in your own and you, you understand that you can have a great impact solving problem, but you, you're actually very well qualified to find bigger problems and you have to let go on solving this problem yourself so you can manage having more time to find those problems. And this is where you have to put a lot of trust in your team, the team you've been building for so, many, so long after that. You know that they are going to be able to solve these problems, even if they, it's not exactly the way you were going to solve it. And you have to let go on that. And like, what you want is the problem to be solved, not forcibly exactly the, one you wanted to, the, the way you wanted it to be solved. I hope it helps. <laughs> so the question is, how do you build a network of other staff engineers if you are from a tiny company and there is only one staff engineer in your company? Well, you don't forcibly have to look inside your own company. You can look around. Uh, one good way I found, like, first is to listen to staff engineers. And, for example, the podcast from the Staff, en uh, St uh, staff Eng uh, website is amazing. It's a lot of uh, very, very smart persons in different companies that have been, like, facing the same kind of issues you've been facing. Uh, the other thing you can do is, like, there is a Staff Eng Slack where, like, everybody can go and just build a network and ask questions, things like this. Very useful, too. Or oh, go to conferences, find other staff engineers in other companies, go talk to me after this, and come here to boat. So the question is, you are going to be mistake, to do mistakes as you are like a staff engineer, and like, how do you handle them, or do you keep trust with the engineers behind you uh, when you do those mistakes? This is a very good question. Uh, I, this is still something I struggle a lot with. Uh, you're going to make mistakes, like you were doing mistakes before in your life, and like it's, if you are in a good company, it's always like recognized and like we just go forward and like we try to not do the mistakes again. Uh, something that Will Larson is saying in his book is like try to never be wrong. And this is a very interesting way to say like try to listen to people, listen what are the problems they're having, listen like what is the concern, what are the concerns they have about the solutions or like the problems you're like raising and try to find a common ground with them rather than saying like oh we're going this direction and I don't care and you're going to like crash yourself. Try to find what is the middle ground, so either you are all right or you are all wrong at the same time. But you're still going to make mistakes and you have to own them, you have to acknowledge them, and try to not repeat them. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good lunch. <laughs>